Broken World, a Book TV original. Written by Merrick Stone. Audiobook produced by Book TV. Please visit our story sponsor, Novel Nutrition, and check out Book TV's specially formulated reader supplements at novelnutrition.co. Make sure you use code Book TV for 20% off your first order. You forget what you want to remember, and you remember what you want to forget. From Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Chapter 1 Forgotten World I woke up to a world bathed in the soft light of dawn, yet it felt like I was seeing it through a veil. My eyes opened to a view of towering structures, their once proud facades now etched with the wrinkles of decay. The ground beneath me was hard and cold, a mosaic of concrete and rubble. I sat up, my head throbbing with a dull ache, and looked around, searching for something, anything that felt familiar. But familiarity was as absent as the people who used to fill these streets. The city, with its looming buildings and abandoned cars, whispered tales of a life that once was. But my mind was frustratingly silent. I tried to grasp at the tendrils of my memory, but they slipped away, leaving me with a haunting sense of loss. I stood up, brushing off the dust from my clothes, a suit that seemed like it belonged to someone else. My pockets were empty, no wallet. No ID. Nothing to tell me who I was. Who am I? I thought. The eerie silence of the city was broken only by the distant sound of a bird, its call echoing through the empty streets. It did not answer my question. With no answer forthcoming, I began to walk. As I walked, I noticed the subtle signs that something had gone terribly wrong. The windows of the shops were shattered, their contents looted or left to rot. Not complete destruction, but enough to give me pause. Graffiti adorned some walls, cryptic messages that hinted at chaos and fear. Yet, there were no bodies, no signs of violence, just the silent, oppressive feeling of a world that had moved on without me. I found myself at a crossroads, literally and metaphorically. The street signs, faded and barely legible, offered no guidance. I looked down each path, hoping for some spark of recognition, but there was none. I chose a direction at random driven by the need to find answers, to find myself. Who am I? As I ventured deeper into the city, the sun climbed higher, casting light on the scars that marred the landscape. I saw a playground, its swings swaying gently in the breeze, a haunting reminder of the children who once played there. The sight stirred something in me, a flicker of emotion that vanished as quickly as it came. Who am I? Again the question drifted, unanswered. Navigating through an intricate plot requires stamina and mental acuity. Epic by Novel Nutrition is designed to be your silent partner in this journey. It's not just a supplement, it's a tribute to your epic adventures in reading, enhancing your endurance through long hours of captivating narratives. Get 20% off your first Novel Nutrition order with Codebook TV at novelnutrition.co and make every reading session legendary. Chapter 2 Whispers of History The second day dawned, and I was no closer to understanding who I was or what had happened to this world. The city stretched out before me, a labyrinth of forgotten stories. My stomach growled, reminding me of more immediate needs. I needed to find food, water, something to sustain me in this desolate place, other than wisping half-memories. I stumbled upon a small convenience store, its windows shattered. Inside. I scavenged what little I could find, a few bottles of half-drunk water and some canned goods that had seen better days. The expiration dates were faded, but hunger left no room for pickiness. As I ate, I pondered over the silent tales the store told, shelves half-empty instead of bare, a cash register left open, dollar bills rustling with the breeze, a crinkled newspaper from a date I couldn't remember lying on the counter. The headlines were smudged, but I could make out words like, escalation unrest, and evacuation. It was a puzzle with too many missing pieces. After eating, I continued my aimless journey through the city. What else was there to do? I passed through what once must have been a bustling marketplace. Stalls lay abandoned, their colorful awnings faded and torn. Here and there I saw graffiti, not the mindless tagging of vandals, but desperate messages from those who had lived through whatever had happened. We will not forget, 
one read. Another. The end was just the beginning. I shivered, despite the growing warmth of the day. My ambling continued. Later I found a park, overgrown and wild, nature reclaiming what was once manicured and tame. I sat on a bench, trying to piece together the fragments of this world's story. Birds chirped, a stark contrast to the silence of the city. They seemed to be the only other living creatures around. Still, they didn't answer my muted questions. As the sun began to set, I stumbled upon something unexpected. A mural, partially obscured by ivy. It depicted a crowd of people, faces contorted with anger and fear. In the background, a flag, but not one I recognized. It was similar to the American flag, but different. Altered in a way that suggested division and conflict. This was no ordinary civil unrest. It was something deeper, more profound. I kept walking. Night fell, and I found shelter in an abandoned apartment building that smelled of abandoned sewage pipes. As I lay in the darkness, my mind raced with questions. Who was I before all this? How did I survive? Most importantly, who was I? The mural haunted me. The distorted flag a symbol of a nation torn apart. A world unmade. And in that unmaking, what role had I played? Sleep was elusive, my dreams haunted by shadows and whispers of a history I could not remember. When dawn broke, I knew I had to continue my trek, not just for survival, but for the truth of who I was and what had happened to this fractured world. Chapter 3. Fragments of Conflict The third day greeted me with a sky painted in hues of orange and pink, a beautiful facade over the broken world. As I left the shelter of the abandoned apartment, a determination settled within me. I needed to delve deeper, to uncover the layers of this mystery that was both the world's and mine. My exploration took me to residential areas. Houses lined the streets, their doors ajar, gardens overgrown. It was in one of these houses that I found my first real clue. A family photo album, left on a dusty coffee table. I can't tell you why I picked it up other than magnetism. The pictures inside depicted happier times, but towards the end, the smiles faded. There were photos of protests, people with faces full of passion and anger, holding signs with slogans I couldn't fully understand. One sign stood out, reading, No more lies, no more control. The context was still murky, but the undercurrents of rebellion and dissent were clear. Just like the mural. In the kitchen, I found newspapers piled up. The topmost one dated just a few weeks before whatever disaster had struck. The headline spoke of political turmoil, a government teetering on the brink of collapse, talks of secession in some states, and a nation deeply divided. There were mentions of skirmishes, isolated incidents of violence that seemed to be escalating. The articles were careful, the journalists treading a fine line, but the fear was palpable between the lines. I left the house with a heavy heart and continued my journey. The city was transforming before my eyes, from a place of desolation to a canvas that depicted a society unraveling at the seams. I found a school next, the playground silent, swings swaying gently in the breeze. Inside, children's drawings lined the walls of a classroom. Amongst the typical childhood depictions of families and animals, there were darker themes, tanks, soldiers, explosions. The innocence of these drawings was a stark reminder of how deeply the conflict had penetrated everyday life. As the day wore on, I ventured into what looked like a small community center. It was here that I found a more direct piece of the puzzle. A wall was dedicated to a timeline of events, created with care by someone trying to make sense of the chaos. It chronicled the rise of political factions, the breakdown of dialogue, and the eventual slide into open conflict. There were gaps pieces missing or perhaps deliberately removed, but it painted a picture of a nation tearing itself apart from the inside. In a back room, I discovered an old cassette player and a stash of cassette recordings. On them were personal accounts of those who had lived through the early days of the conflict. Their voices were filled with confusion, fear, and a sense of betrayal. They spoke of friends turned enemies, of propaganda that poisoned minds, and of a leadership that seemed more interested in power than in the people. Each cassette was labeled with a name. Jane Haskins, Brian Waller, Toby Franks. The names meant nothing to me. It seemed that history thought the same. As night approached, I found myself back on the streets, the clues I had gathered swirling in my mind. 
The conflict. The division. It was all too real. Too painful. But how did it end? What was the final straw that broke the world? Why was I looked for these clues? I couldn't tell you. But something about the mystery pulled me on. Or maybe it pushed me to find the next crumbs. Chapter 4. Echoes in the Rubble The dawn of the fourth day brought with it a newfound caution. As I awoke in the gray light of morning, a realization settled over me like a cold mist. I was utterly alone in a world I didn't understand, and my ignorance made me vulnerable. Whoever I was, whatever I'd been, there could be others out there, remnants of the past, who might recognize me, for better or worse. I decided to change my strategy. Instead of aimlessly wandering the city, I would move with purpose, seeking out specific places that might hold the keys to the world's destruction, maybe to my past. But I would do so with caution, always aware of the potential eyes that could be following me. My first destination was the city hall. If there were any records left of the time before, they might be there. The building stood solemn and imposing, its once grand facade scarred by the ravages of fire and time. Inside, the halls were silent, the echoes of my footsteps a stark reminder of the absence of life. I rummaged through offices and filing cabinets, finding mostly mundane documents, permits, city planning records, budget reports. But here and there, I found snippets of something more. Emergency plans for civil unrest, correspondence hinting at political pressure. Memos that spoke of increasing security measures. Requests for bodyguards and soldiers. Roles of the dead. It was in a small forgotten office that I found the most chilling piece of evidence. A map of the city with certain areas marked in red. They were concentrated in certain neighborhoods, with dates next to them. My mind did the heavy lifting. The dates corresponded to some of the more violent incidents mentioned in the newspapers I had found earlier. This was no mere record of events. It was a plan. A calculated strategy. As I stood there, staring at the map, a shiver ran down my spine. I suddenly felt exposed, standing in the heart of what once was the nerve center of the city's governance. If there were any place that was being watched, it would be here. I quickly gathered the most relevant documents, stuffing them into a bag I'd scrounged the first day, and hurried out of the building. The rest of the day, I moved through the city with a heightened sense of awareness. I avoided open streets, sticking to alleys in the shadows of buildings. Every rustle of wind, every creak of a loose sign, set me on edge. I realized that I wasn't just looking for answers anymore. I was also trying to stay hidden from something, anything. By evening, I found another abandoned apartment on the outskirts of the city. It was less likely to attract attention than my previous shelter. As I settled in for the night, the documents I had taken spread out before me. A deep sense of unease took hold. I had started this journey seeking answers about my identity and the world's downfall. Now, I was also grappling with the frightening possibility that I was being hunted by ghosts of a past I couldn't remember. My sleep was restless, filled with half-remembered dreams, and a growing paranoia that I was not as alone as I'd thought. Step into a world where every page sparkles with raw by novel nutrition. This supplement is your key to unlocking the enchantment in every story, enhancing your energy and focus as you explore realms of fantasy and lore. Experience the magic of reading with a special 20% off your first order using code BOOKTV at novelnutrition.co. Chapter 5. The Silent Witness The fifth morning broke with a heavy, oppressive air. I awoke in the abandoned apartment, the remnants of my restless dreams lingering like shadows in my mind. The documents I had scavenged lay scattered around me, each a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that was this broken world, and my place in it. But with each clue I uncovered, the weight of unease grew heavier on my shoulders. I couldn't shake the feeling that eyes were upon me, watching my every move from the nooks and crannies of the city. I decided to delve deeper into the city's residential areas, hoping to find more personal accounts of the days leading up to the collapse. Maybe in the diaries and letters of those who had lived through it, I would find a reflection of my own story. But as I navigated through the silent streets, my steps were hesitant, my senses on high alert. 
Every creak of a door, every flutter of a curtain seemed like a signal of some unseen observer. The city, once a symbol of civilization, now felt like a vast open-air prison, with me as its sole paranoid inmate. The dilapidated houses and overgrown gardens, which I had first seen as mere signs of abandonment, now took on a more sinister slithering. They were not just abandoned, they were witnesses to something unspeakable. In one house, I found a diary, its pages filled with the frantic scrawls of someone trying to make sense of the chaos engulfing their world. The writer spoke of rumors and whispers, of friends disappearing, of nights filled with distant gunfire. As I read, I felt a kinship with this unknown author, their fear, their confusion. It mirrored my own. But it was in the back of the diary that I found something that made my blood run cold. The writer had begun to suspect they were being watched. They wrote of masked figures lurking in the shadows, of being followed, of a creeping dread that they were no longer safe in their own home. The parallels to my own experiences were uncanny, and a terrifying thought took root in my mind. What if these watchers were still here, in this desolate city? What if they were now following me? The rest of the day passed in a blur of anxiety. Every house I entered, every street I crossed, I felt the presence of something or someone just out of sight. I started seeing signs everywhere. A footprint in the dust. A door ajar that I was sure had been closed. A distant figure that vanished when I looked again. As night fell, I found myself back on the outskirts of the city, too afraid to venture into the open. I chose an old, boarded-up house as my shelter, barricading the doors as best I could. But even within these walls, I couldn't escape the feeling of being watched. I lay there in the darkness, my mind racing with fear and paranoia. Who were these watchers? What did they want with me? And most importantly, what had I done to draw their attention other than being alive? I felt a deep foreboding, a sense that I was being drawn into a web of events far beyond my understanding. My sleep was fitful, haunted by the feeling of unseen eyes upon me and the growing fear of what the coming day would bring. Chapter 6. Shadows of the Past The sixth day dawned with a gray, overcast sky that mirrored the turmoil in my mind. The sensation of being watched had not abated. If anything, it had intensified. With each step I took through the city, I felt as though I was moving deeper into a trap set by my own forgotten past. I decided to venture towards the industrial part of the city, where the factories and warehouses stood like dormant giants. Perhaps there, in the remnants of the city's once thriving heartbeat, I could uncover more about the conflict and my life in it. But as I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling of being followed. Every rustle of wind, every echo in the empty streets seemed like a whisper of pursuit. We're watching, the city whispered to me. We're watching the city whispered to me. In an old factory, amidst the rusted machinery and conveyor belts frozen in time, I found a collection of personal belongings hastily abandoned. A child's backpack, a worker's helmet, a family photo fallen from someone's locker. These relics of normal life, now coated in dust, spoke of a sudden urgency, danger, even death. It was as if the workers had received a warning, a signal to flee immediately. My mind raced with questions. What had they been warned about? Was it related to the conflict, or something even more sinister? Among these belongings, I discovered a series of hastily written notes, exchanged between the workers. They spoke in veiled terms about something big coming, something that would change everything. One note read, They say it's finally happening. Be ready to leave at a moment's notice. The vagueness of the words was frustrating, but the underlying sense of imminent danger was unmistakable. As I left the factory, the sense of being followed grew stronger. I kept looking over my shoulder, catching glimpses of shadows that seemed to move just beyond my line of sight. Paranoia gripped me, a visceral, clawing thing that made my heart race and my breath come in short gasps. In the late afternoon, I stumbled upon a small, secluded park, a forgotten oasis in the midst of urban decay. I sat on a bench, trying to collect my thoughts but my mind was a whirlwind of fear and confusion. It was here that I experienced the most unnerving encounter yet. I saw a figure standing at the edge of the park, partially hidden by a tree. Our eyes met for a fleeting moment before the figure turned and walked away. The brief encounter sent a jolt of fear through me. Who was this person? 
Why were they watching me? Why did they leave? Would they come back? I didn't wait to find out. I ran as fast as my wobbling legs allowed, finding the first hole that would swallow my shivering form. As night approached, I found an abandoned apartment building, its upper floors relatively intact. There, in a small room with boarded-up windows, I tried to calm my racing mind. As night approached, I found an abandoned apartment building, its upper floors relatively intact. There, in a small room with boarded-up windows, I tried to calm my racing mind. I lay in the darkness, listening to the sounds of the night. The distant howl of a dog, the creaking of the building, the ever-present whispers of the wind. In those moments, I felt more lost and alone than ever. The shadows of the past were closing in, and I was no closer to understanding who I was or why I felt so inexorably tied to the city's downfall. The night was long, filled with the echoes of my own thoughts and the unshakable feeling that something, or someone, was just outside, waiting. Every hero in a story has a secret weapon. Yours is Hero, a novel nutrition supplement formulated especially for book lovers. Hero supports your reading adventure with a boost to cognitive health. Try it now and get 20% off your first order with code BOOKTV at novelnutrition.co. Chapter 7. The Road to Ruin On the seventh day, the first light of dawn felt like an intruder in my makeshift sanctuary. The paranoia that had taken root in me grew like a dark vine, winding its way through my thoughts. I knew I couldn't stay hidden forever. The answers I sought were out there, in the skeletal remains of the city. But with each step I took, the fear that I was being hunted grew stronger. I decided to head toward what used to be the financial district, a place where the heartbeats of countless businesses once pulsed. Now, it stood silent, the towering buildings like tombstones, marking the death of a once vibrant economy. The streets here were lined with luxury cars left to gather dust, windows of high-end stores shattered, their wares looted or left to decay. In one of the office buildings, I found a room that looked like it had been used as a makeshift command center. Maps covered the walls, marked with strategic points and scribbled notes. Amidst the chaos of papers and abandoned electronics, I found a series of forgotten laptop plugged into car battery. My hands trembled as I searched for the power button. Somehow, magically, the screen came to life. There were a set of files on the main screen, and I clicked on the first, eyes scanning, processing. The files revealed a network of communication between what appeared to be different factions within the government and military. The messages were cryptic, but the tone was urgent, laced with fear, and something else. A sense of impending doom. One email in particular caught my attention. It was sent just days before the collapse. A final plea for reason in a world gone mad. The sender wrote of a last resort that could end everything. A desperate solution to a problem that had spiraled out of control. My mind raced as I tried to piece together the story these files told. It was clear that the conflict had reached a boiling point, with factions vying for power in a game that had no winners. But what was this last resort, and how had it led to the desolation that now surrounded me? I left the building feeling more unsettled than ever. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly coming together, but the picture they formed was one of catastrophe, a series of decisions and actions that had led to the world's end. And in that picture, I feared I might find myself. As I walked, the feeling of being followed intensified. I kept seeing fleeting shadows out of the corner of my eye, heard footsteps that seemed to echo my own. I was no longer sure if these were figments of my imagination, or if I was truly being pursued. The city had become a maze, and I felt like a rat trapped within its walls, constantly on the run from an unseen predator. As night fell, I found refuge in the basement of an abandoned hotel. It was a place of darkness and cobwebs but it felt secure, hidden from prying eyes. I barricaded the door as best I could and huddled in the corner, trying to make sense of the chaos that my life had become. Sleep was a stranger to me that night. My mind was a whirlpool of fear and suspicion, every sound a potential threat. I clutched a piece of broken pipe like a talisman, a feeble defense against the dangers I felt closing in on me. The darkness of the basement was suffocating, but I dared not venture out. In the depths of that night, 
I realized that the journey I had embarked upon was more perilous than I had imagined. Not only was I seeking the truth about the world's end and my identity, but I was also fighting a battle against an unseen enemy, one that might be as much a part of me as the forgotten memories I was trying to unearth. The road to ruin, it seemed, was paved with shadows and fear, and I was walking it alone. Chapter 8 The Unveiling As the eighth day unfurled its gray, somber skies, the city seemed to take on an even more menacing form. The buildings loomed over me like silent judges, their broken windows like eyes that followed my every move. The once familiar streets now felt like a labyrinth designed to confuse and entrap. Every corner I turned, every abandoned vehicle I passed, seemed to hide potential threats. The city had transformed from a mere backdrop to an active participant in my growing horror. I made my way to what used to be a broadcasting station, thinking that perhaps there, I could find some recordings or files that would shed light on the events leading up to the collapse. The building was a fortress of silence, its doors ajar, inviting yet foreboding. As I stepped inside, the echo of my footsteps seemed too loud, a beacon to anyone or anything that might be lurking in the shadows. I found the main control room, a chaos of overturned chairs and scattered papers. The screens were lifeless, the equipment dormant. As I sifted through the debris, I discovered more audio tapes, labeled with dates leading up to the final days. My hands shook as I loaded the first tape into the still-functioning player. The recordings were a mixture of news broadcasts and emergency messages. The newscasters' voices were tinged with barely concealed panic as they reported on escalating conflicts, political upheaval, and social unrest. The emergency messages were more direct, warnings of martial law, curfews, and evacuation orders. The tension in the air was palpable, even through the crackling recordings. But it was the final recording that froze my blood. A frantic broadcaster, voice quivering with fear, spoke of a last-ditch effort to end the conflict, a decision made in desperation. The broadcast was cut off abruptly, ending in static. The implications were clear. Whatever had been done in those final hours had been catastrophic. As I left the station, the city felt even more oppressive, its air thick with the ghosts of those last broadcasts. The sense of foreboding that had been my constant companion now turned into outright terror. The city was no longer just a place of ruin. It was a tomb, a monument to a world that had self-destructed. I should leave, I thought. I should leave and find another place to die. And yet, I didn't leave. I didn't want to die. I had a mystery to unravel first. As dusk fell, the shadows grew longer, transforming the streets into a maze of dark corners and hidden dangers. I felt eyes on me from every direction, real or imagined. It didn't matter. My own footsteps sounded alien, a reminder of my isolation in this post-apocalyptic world. I sought shelter in an old fire station, its garage doors wide open, like the maw of some giant beast. Inside, I found a truck still parked, its sides adorned with faded insignia. I climbed into the back, seeking the illusion of safety. But even there, surrounded by the remnants of a time when people fought to save others, I couldn't escape the feeling of dread. That night, as I tried to find rest in the back of the truck, the city seemed to close in on me. Every noise was magnified. The scuttling of rats, the creaking of metal, the distant collapse of something heavy. In my mind's eye, the city transformed into a living, breathing entity, its streets and buildings conspiring to keep me trapped in this nightmare. Who am I? I thought as I finally drifted off to sleep. In the whirlwind of daily life, finding your reading zen can be a challenge. That's where Read by Novel Nutrition steps in. Specifically formulated to aid readers in achieving a state of focused calm, Read is your gateway to truly immersive reading experiences. Secure your first bottle with a 20% discount using code BOOKTV and transform each reading session into a zen retreat at novelnutrition.co. Chapter 9. The Weight of the World The ninth day broke with a heavy fog that clung to the ruins of the city like a shroud. As I emerged from the fire station, the world around me felt dreamlike, the outlines of buildings and streets blurred by the mist. The oppressive atmosphere of the city was now palpable, 
almost a physical force pressing down on me, laden with the weight of untold stories and unspoken horrors. My destination for the day was the city's main library, a place where I hoped to find more comprehensive records, historical accounts, anything that could provide context to the fragments I had gathered. The grand building stood forlorn, its once imposing architecture now just another relic of a world gone by. Inside, the silence was overwhelming, the rows of books and archives untouched, yet feeling like they were screaming their stories into the void. I found myself wishing for a librarian to hush me as my muck-covered shoes scraped the stone floor. I plunged into the newspaper section, poring over editions that chronicled the years leading up to the cataclysm. The more I read, the more the picture of a society tearing itself apart became clear. Political ideologies had clashed with unprecedented ferocity, misinformation had spread like wildfire, and fear had been the order of the day. The words leaped out at me, a cacophony of anger, fear, and desperation. In one of the dusty corners of the library, I found a private collection of journals and personal accounts. I wondered who'd thought to collect them. Had they been taken from the dead? The journals told stories of families torn apart, friendships betrayed, and communities divided. The personal nature of these accounts made the history I had read come alive with painful clarity. These were not just events, they were personal tragedies, each entry a testament to the human cost of the conflict. As the day waned, I sat amidst the sea of books and papers, feeling the weight of the tragedy that had befallen the world. It was not just the physical destruction, but the collapse of trust, the loss of hope, and the disintegration of a society that had once been whole. And then in the dim light of the library, I made a chilling discovery in a librarian's private office. A series of handwritten documents, stuffed in a top drawer, revealed the whispers of shadowy group that had operated at the highest levels of government. This group had manipulated events, fanned the flames of conflict, all to serve their own agenda. The documents were incomplete, but they hinted at a level of betrayal and manipulation that was almost inconceivable. The realization hit me like a physical blow. The conflict, the chaos, the collapse. It wasn't just a result of societal divisions. It had been orchestrated, carefully planned by those who had promised to protect and lead. And amidst the names mentioned in those documents, one stood out, a name that sent a shockwave of recognition through me. It was my own. I stumbled out of the library as night began to fall, my mind reeling. The pieces were coming together, but they formed a picture that I could not yet fully comprehend. The city, with its haunting presence, felt like it was closing in on me, the buildings and streets now bearing witness to my own part in this tragedy. I knew the way now, like I'd walked those streets a thousand times. That night, as I found shelter in an abandoned subway station, the weight of what I'd discovered lay heavy on my heart. I was not just a lost soul wandering through the ruins. I was a part of the story, a player in the tragedy. The realization was crushing, and as I closed my eyes, the darkness of the subway tunnel merged with the darkness in my soul, a fitting backdrop for the turmoil that consumed me. Chapter 10 Revelation in Ruins On the tenth day, as the first light of dawn filtered through the grime-streaked windows of the subway station, I awoke with a sense of clarity that had eluded me since the beginning of my journey. The pieces of the puzzle, scattered and fragmented as they were, began to form a coherent, if horrifying, picture. I was not merely a witness to the downfall of the world. I was a key player in its demise. The city, in its ruinous state, seemed to mirror the turmoil within me. I walked through the streets with a heavy heart, the weight of the revelations from the library still pressing down on me. The fog from the previous day had lifted, but the clarity it brought was no comfort. Everywhere I looked, I saw remnants of the life that had been, now forever lost, and I couldn't help but feel responsible. I made my way back to the heart of the city, drawn by an inexplicable need to confront my past. The once bustling downtown area was now a ghost town, the skyscrapers standing as silent sentinels over a world that had ceased to be. I found my way to a government building, one that I had instinctively avoided until now. Its doors were ajar, as if inviting me to uncover the secrets it held. It was there that I would commit my final penance and take my own life. Inside, I found more than just bureaucratic records and official documents. I found a trail leading to my own past. 
photographs, memos, and reports painted a picture of a man deeply involved in the machinations of power. A man who looked back at me from every photograph. It was me, but not a version of myself that I could recognize. This version of me was confident, powerful, and deeply entangled in the events that led to the catastrophe. In a locked office, which I somehow knew how to access, I found the final piece of the puzzle. A series of files tacked up on a corkboard detailed a plan, a plan that I had been a part of, to use a catastrophic event as a means of consolidating power and control. But the plan had spiraled out of control, leading to the very apocalypse that had destroyed everything. The truth hit me with the force of a titan's punch. I was not just a bystander or a victim of the world's end. I was one of its architects. The knowledge was suffocating, and I sank to the floor, overcome with grief and guilt. The city around me, with its decaying buildings and silent streets, was a monument to my own hubris and folly. I didn't want to be there. I was too much of a coward to take my own life. So I left the building, the stooped and sorry specimen of a man once rich and powerful. As the day turned to evening, I found myself wandering aimlessly through the city. The revelations of my past left me shattered and morose. I was a ghost, haunting the ruins of a world I had helped destroy. I spent the night on the roof of a building, overlooking the city. The stars above were obscured by clouds, a fitting metaphor for the darkness that now enveloped my heart. I was so intent on the scene before me that I almost missed the sounds behind me. Something, or someone, had opened the roof access door I'd left ajar. I turned as I stood and almost stumbled back and over the side when I saw the masked form. The figure reached up, pulled the mask off, and for the first time since the person in the park, I saw another human face. He looked unremarkable, and yet somehow familiar. He grinned like he knew what I was thinking. Then he reached into his pocket. I fully expected a weapon to emerge and blast me from the roof. Instead, a syringe and cap needled came out in the gloved hand. I took a tentative step back. The man raised his other hand. Whoa. It's okay. He took a step forward and beckoned me to do the same. I did not. I stayed right where I stood. Then he smiled again and said, Come on, boss. Experiment's over. It's time to go home. We hope you have enjoyed this story. If you have, please share this audiobook with a friend. Your friend will appreciate it and the Gigabizzle Buppenheimers of the algorithm will like it too.